So I am going to start with introducing um, Ludovic uh, Thiele, who is the, the chief executive of Coimbra Group. And uh, I would like to thank Ludovic for all the support he has given us and, uh, and, uh, and the patience. And, uh, and uh, we are really pleased to, to be part of, of such network as, as Coimbra Group. And we hope to, to continue working, uh, uh, to continue contributing to, to the work of the network through our Latin America working group. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to spotlight. Okay, so do we change the screen? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> I think you can, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So can you confirm you can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you perfect, thank you. Okay, so good afternoon and good morning, uh, because we are indeed on several uh, time zones. Uh, dear Secretary General of the Association of Universities of the Montevideo Group, Estimado Alvaro, dear Chair of the Coimbra Group Latin America Working Group, dear Sole, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely pleased to be with you today for the launch of this important book, Why Latin America Matters. And when I say important, I really mean it. Uh, this collection of short essays provides a timely contemporary perspective on Latin America as a continent that can make a meaningful contribution to the complex challenges that humanity faces, climate change, health crisis, inequalities, migrations, to mention only a few. And on behalf of the executive board of the Quimba Group, I would like to welcome all the speakers who are taking an active part in the rich program of this afternoon or morning. And together, they will bring valuable expertise from a variety of fields, disciplines, and countries. So really many thanks to, to each of you. I also warmly welcome all the participants to this virtual uh, book launch. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, you, for you being here. Uh, welcome to all of you, bienvenidos. And let me first start by congratulating the Latin America Working Group of the Quimba Group, and more specifically uh, its chair and vice chair, uh, dear Soledad from Edinburgh, dear Marta from uh, Krakow, and also our colleague Hans from Bergen, uh, for the outstanding efforts in making this book a reality. This book perfectly exemplifies what the Quimba Group is all about, the story of cooperation and policy impact and I would like to share with you three short reflections in that regard. The first one is about collaboration, which lies at the heart of all our activities. Finding solutions together, learning from each other, exchanging on our practices within, but also outside our network. In this context, we have always been keen to maintain a close relationship with Latin America. This all started with, uh, with a pilot project funded by the European Commission to stay connected with our Latin America alumni back in 1987. This relationship has constantly expanded and grown since then, thanks to the energy of the members of our Latin America working group. And we are also celebrating this year a decade of collaboration with our friends from AUGM, the Association of Universities of the Montevideo Group. We want to reinforce this long-standing partnership, and for this we will strive to align our cooperation on the policy priorities driving the EU-Latin America cooperation in the fields of higher education, research, and innovation. We have also developed cooperation with other university networks in Latin America, such as UDUAL, or the Coimbra Group of Brazilian Universities. Something that I particularly value in this book is the dialogue of knowledge between academics from both continents and between disciplines. It offers a much more complex reading of common issues to Europe and Latin America, many of them being encompassed by the sustainable development goals. And this leads me to the second reflection, which is about policy impacts. The Quema Group has initiated a series of events and policy debates on the sustainable development goals promoted by the United Nations. The latest event took place last month at the UN headquarters in Geneva, where we brought together directors and vice directors of the Quema Group of Universities with uh, the heads of UN agencies to discuss together the roadmap towards achieving the 2030 agenda. We have had extremely interesting exchanges on the crucial role of academic research, 
to achieve the SDGs and concrete ways to leverage the cooperation between academia and policymakers for the benefit of society as a whole. And the, the executive board is now working on developing new actions in this area at the level of the Kremer group. And I'm very pleased uh, to, to, to see that the, the, the rich content of this book, Why Latin America Matters, is fully in resonating uh, with the spirit of our discussions in Geneva. And here I'm thinking about the co-production of scientific knowledge with external stakeholders and local communities about the analysis of a science policy interface in environmental decision making or about the values of arts, humanities and social sciences, to mention only uh, some of the essays. And clearly this book contributes to disseminate insightful data analysis and observations that are directly connected to many SDGs. And I'm therefore very convinced that this will be most useful and a source of inspiration to policymakers and everyone actively engaged in achieving the agenda for 2030. And last but not least, I would like to conclude by telling that the motto of the Prima Group, the tradition of innovation, has crossed my mind several times when reading the book. I found it uh, indeed particularly interesting for the reader that some essays focus on the potential offered by very ancient traditions in Latin America, whereas other contributors share the lessons learned from extremely innovative experiences and projects. My congratulations again for the editorial committee for such a timely, relevant and qualitative publication. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend the whole session due to prior commitments, and I have to leave you uh, in the excellent hands of Soledad, who is going a fantastic job as the chair of the Latin America Working Group. But I wish you very fruitful and productive discussion. And of course, I personally encourage you to all get your copy and take the time to read this book that is now out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ludovic. It's such a pleasure to, to be able to have you here. And I'm really pleased that you managed to make it at least for these few minutes. And, I'm really pleased that, that you have read the book and you, you found uh, uh, so many um, aspects of it that, that are engaging and useful and, and potentially um, uh, really draw on the, on the objectives of the Coimbra group. So I'm really happy and, uh, and I would like to really thank you for, for all your support here. Um, I think the co-production of, of scientific knowledge is, is extremely important. I was participating this week from COP26 and uh, more than ever, it, it was evident that we can't see the problems that are forthcoming uh, from one discipline or from one geographical perspective. So, so the understanding of all of these different experiences will really help us, I hope. But thank you again, and uh, we will be in touch. <laughs> thank you. So now um, I would like to introduce you to our dear Anna Lucia Gasola, um, who is Emeritus Professor of the Federal University of Minas Gerais. She was also a former director of the UNESCO Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean and coordinator of the Regional Conference, Conference on Higher Education. And uh, she was also former Secretary of Social Development and Education in the state of Minas Gerais and has so kindly accepted to read this book well before it was, um, it was really a, <laughs> a reality. So, um, so I think uh, it, was, it was lovely to have her and her thoughts uh, as, as an initial, uh, there you are, okay, as an initial, um, an initial perspective over this and, and your words made us feel so happy, Anuzia. <laughs> Thank you so much, so welcome. Uh, thank you, Soledad. Thank you, Ludovic. Uh, hello to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, my dear Alvaro Malia, a friend of so many decades of common work in Maritina, such a good help, and to everyone who is here with us this morning or this afternoon. First of all, I want to thank the Coimbra Group for the invitation to write the prologue of the book, Why Latin America Matters. It is an honor and a double pleasure for the quality and relevance of this publication, particularly from my Latin American point of view, but also for my historical connection to the Coimbra Group. When I was director or president of the Federal University of Minas Gerais, 
here in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, from 2002 to 2006, or as you say in the United Kingdom, Vice Chancellor, we joined the Coimbra Group and we organized one of its meetings in Belo Horizonte, where our main campus is located. My director of international relations was Professor Sandra Almeida, who is now the president of our university, re-elected yesterday with 95% of the votes. Now we have to wait for the president of the Republic to honor the choice of the community, which has not been his practice. Uh, the relationship with the Coimbra Group was always very productive and pleasant, and I'm very happy to be here with you. I also thank Alvaro and Aujeme for indicating me for the text. But I have a confession to make. When I got the text and went through the list of authors, I realized that a great number, the majority of them, was from Europe or worked in Europe. I confess that I had a first moment of post-colonial discomfort. And I quickly wrote my friend Alvaro Malia to inquire about the genesis of the book. And he explained it was an open call to colleagues from the universities of Group Coimbra. Imagine my first anguish. What if I have to comment on a book whose perspective I did not share? So this post-colonial reaction was soothed by Alvaro when I realized that the manner in which the book was constructed was based on a very democratic methodology. But still, I was somewhat concerned that it could be one more case of Eurocentric perspectives reinforcing the North-South binary and hegemonic view and then I started reading the articles. And I soon realized this was going to be the opposite, configuring a trajectory of profound reflection, not only on Latin America, but mainly on the possibility of productive interaction between our two regions with mutual impact academically and socially. This immediately reminded me that the Coimbra Group always strived for solidary internationalization, which was the theme of our meeting here in Belo Horizonte. So let me start my comments by saying that in my opinion, Why Latin America Matters is a necessary book whose essays present reflections that are strategic always, but particularly at this moment in history. The point of departure seems to be the question, does Latin America matter? The answer could be yes, a very quick, quick answer. But this obviously does not say anything. It is not enough as a political statement. In fact, all countries matter. All regions matter. Every individual matters, the planet matters, but most times they don't matter in the same way. The meaning of the verb, or rather the significance applied to it is what makes a difference. What do the authors and the organizers understand by the verb matters? And we, the readers, how are we to interpret this verb? And because language is not static, I am a professor of literature. Language has historical interpretations. It changes in time. It is polysemic. How did Latin America matter in the past? How does it matter today? How will it matter in the future? I am absolutely certain that the manner in which we deal with such questions today will confirm the possibility of a very open and 
complex meaning for this equation, Latin America matters. And we are going to build future perceptions, future possibilities of analysis from the present point of view, which vary accordingly, as Ludovic has said, with the motto of the Coimbra group, has a foot in tradition, another in innovation, or we could say one in the past, the historical construction of such concepts and political positions, and one in the future as a prospective movement forward. So how can this book contribute to a resignification of the concept? This, in my opinion, is the main question put to the authors and that all of them in different manners from different disciplinary perspectives strive to answer. It is a complex question about an equally complex, diverse, heterogeneous reality. But in fact, it's not only Latin America which is complex. Every social fact is complex so that it requires for its analysis, a multiplicity of gazes, a multiplicity of visions, a multiplicity of disciplinary perspective that should, perspectives that should not be isolated one from the other, but come together in a transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary manner to provide a complex gaze as complex as the social fact observed. All of the authors in this book present comprehensive analysis on a broad range of aspects of Latin American history and present situations, or how Latin American history has created the contemporary complex situations that we must confront elucidate in order to move forward with learnings from the past, but a perspective of the future that should not lose a certain utopian quality that must be present in research, in teaching, in higher education, and in our lives and actions as individuals. How should those authors help us, all of us, European, Latin American scholars and individuals understand not only our challenges, but the possible solution to such challenges. And even more than that, how do those challenges impact our present, our future and the world's future because everything is interconnected in this global situation of movements, metaphors, everything that we do together as the virus has taught us. It respects no differences, no frontiers. And so why should we in intellectual and scientific analysis work exclusively within national frontiers? Obviously, a broader view is necessary, not only to get out of this pandemic, but to avoid new pandemics and to move forward as a common humankind that take this planet as our common house. The essays focus on different types of challenges, such as health, climate change, risk management, one that's very dear to me, the role of humanities in all of this, the role of art and social sciences to provide more complex views of reality, migrant movements, the importance of civil society, urban and rural challenges, alternative concepts of development and production, community building, a very strategic topic today, and how to change, but to preserve regional 
and cultural identities in new productive interaction, productive interaction and association across our borders and frontiers. It is a broad range of themes and aspects. They are not exhaustive, but they make justice to the complexity of the very concept Latin America. However, the variety of subjects under scrutiny does not produce a fragmented body. As I read the index, the list of content, the table of contents, I always thought, my God, how are they going to articulate all that? This could become a Frankenstein. Each part very interesting, but with no whole. And we need to go back to the main concept. We need to articulate all parts to a productive view of a whole as the title and the question implied in it presents us. On the contrary, what I found is that all of the authors, whether they talked before, but probably not, they present unifying themes. So maybe we should conclude that reality is complex, but not as complex. We can find unifying themes because science is one, it changes in history. We learn with our mistakes. We try, make errors, adjust and correct, but science is science. Of course, we may have different versions of truth, but if we put the principles together, and if we look with an open mind from our individual perspective, to the same facts, it is impossible not to find some common ingredients, some variables that remain throughout and some unifying things. But mainly, maybe you were all capable of unifying the themes of the essays because of the common methodological perspective you have used. Methodology leads to a certain type of content. From the standpoint where we are, we look at reality and the locus of enunciation, the point where I locate myself, the point where we all locate ourselves makes a difference. And the common methodology that you have here, mainly comparative, mainly social benchmarking, mainly intellectual openness, mainly a humble attitude of not imposing one's views, but learning from reality, listening to the interlocutors, establishing interactive in product, productive interaction. This is what made the difference. This is what allowed all of you to reach the core of each theme as it relates to this complex concept of Latin America and as it, each one, contributes to enrich and elucidate such concept. So the common methodolo methodological perspectives provide an original and useful contribution to Latin American studies. And furthermore, with a product, productive impact on transformative visions of Europe. And here I apologize for my first post-colonial reaction. This is how we should approach Europe Latin America, any region, comparing, listening, analyzing, and trying to revisit, resignify our methodologies, our points of view, our prior standpoints and perspectives. It is clear that all of the authors, regardless of their lucky of enunciation, partake of similar views and converge in taking Latin America, 
not as a problem, but as a possibility. They consider that Latin America offers concrete experiences of alternative processes to the hegemonic developmental theory and to the modus operandi of authoritarian, colonialist, and disintegrated public policies that confirm the status quo of exclusion, inequalities, and cultural assimilation. Not talking about economy and all of the inequalities that exist, not only between the developed and non-developed countries in development, but also within our very countries and sometimes within our universities, right, Alvaro? We have so many inequalities in Latin America that we have to confront and look to overcome that really it is, it is absolutely important to think of the type of public policy that moves away from cultural assimilation, exclusion, inequalities, and hegemonic economic models. Reverting the hegemonic approach that considers Latin America as incapable of producing endogenous reflections about its contradictions and historical processes, the authors propose collaborative research and the analysis of case studies that reveal how the region has been confronted its repeated crisis and overcoming several of the constraints to its sustainable and inclusive development. These case studies are analyzed not only in their intrinsic value for the communities represented, but also because they offer Europe some examples of new possibilities to face its own problems. And I should add, it also offers us, intellectuals from Latin America, elites from Latin America, new possibilities, rather than copying blindly models that come from abroad, we should learn from them. We should adapt and adjust them, but we also have lessons to take from our own experiences and histories. Rather than bringing Eurocentric views and tools for Latin America to accept and copy, each essay takes the processes developed in the region as possibilities to learn from, indicating that the dialogue between different types of knowledge, as we say here, el dialogo entre saberes, such as the academic or scientific, and those of social movements, or indigenous populations, as well as the comparative and productive confrontation of perspectives is a reaching not only to us, but to the planet as a whole and to the production of new innovative knowledge. Co-building knowledge implies the belief that I sustain, and I'm sure with all of you, that knowledge is a public good and the universal right. The results of the intellectual and scientific endeavors and of the interaction and mutual impact of different types of knowledge should benefit all society and human beings equally and preserve our environment as our common home. The relational dimension in a planetary scale, which the pandemic of COVID-19 has made acutely evident, demands multi, trans, and interdisciplinary approach for no single view is sufficient for the understanding of our increasingly complex world. And when we look at the development and distribution of vaccines, nowadays we realize that knowledge is not yet a public good and it's not accessible to everyone in the same manner. So the pandemic has brought lessons that I hope we should learn or we have learned. Perhaps our main emergency on a planetary scale after the control of the sanitary crisis 
is the climatic crisis. I tend never to use the term post-pandemic because the effects of COVID-19 will not cease in the next years or decades and will not be equal or the same in every country, in every society. Inequality here is also at stake. So there are lessons to be learned from the pandemic as well as from history. And it's high time we examine how our relationship with nature has been seen and developed by di diverse cultures in different times. A new type of benchmarking is necessary and it is present in this book. Let's look at traditional societies and open our minds to learn from them in order to build sustainable development and social justice. When we think, for example, of traditional agriculture, we see that there is a lot to, a lot to learn in terms of sustainability. This is why the different views presented in this book overcome orthodox binary comparis comparisons and prioritize a relational perspective that moves across cultural and geographic territories, north and south, center and periphery, urban and rural, among others, are categories that must be replaced as the essays in this book do, by an integrated intercultural perspective as this book postulates and carries out. This is defended in terms of the research methodology used, but it also constitutes the main characteristic of the successful experiences discussed. Collective construction, co-participation, integration, democracy, identity, resilience, dialogue and respect of intercultural views, inclusion, bottom-up transformations. These are some of the key concepts pervasive in every essay. And if we put all of these key words together, maybe we have a plan of action and a route, a map of route to move us forward towards the construction of better societies for every human being. Why does Latin America matter? The authors conclude that there are lessons to be learned from the unique experiences the region's history and its present bring us. This is a dialogic collection of essays, much needed today. And it has at the same time instigated me intellectually and politically, but it also touched me deeply on an emotional level because I found in it the transborder, transnational humanism that can pave our way to a better future for all societies and human beings. Congratulations to you all. And as a citizen of Latin America and of the world, thank you. Muito obrigada. <laughs> I don't know how we can do the clapping, but it is so beautiful to hear you, Ana Lucia. It's so, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And uh, it's so emotional to, to hear your words. It's, it's, it's fascinating, your perspective and your experience and, and the way you have um, interpreted and, and uh, um, interrogated the book from, from different perspectives and different questions. So I, I am fascinated with this and, uh, and it's, it's a pleasure. So I, um, I just wanted to, to uh, in the program we had today, I, I wanted the brief introdu introduction to the book, but I will um, skip that because I think um, Ana Lucia was absolutely perfect with the, with the with the explanations and on how we have managed to to put together this uh, um, Frankenstein, and uh, I think uh, I think I, I'm not going to go back to that. Perhaps at the end I'll, I'll explain a little bit the the structure. But as mentioned before, the structure of the book. Um, 
we received essays from a range of disciplines and we really wanted to ensure that uh, that the book was inclusive inclusive of uh, people with different experiences in terms of research um, with different experiences in, in terms of connections with academia and uh, we wanted uh, the book to to really link with a range of disciplines that that could uh, could create a reflection over why Latin America matters. So broadly, um, we uh, then um, uh, structured the book around the, the, the kind of links between articles around cultural and identity, environment and sustainability, governance and democratization, health, migration and human rights, urban and urban resilience. So we have asked for today, we, we wanted to ask one author, at least from every one of these sessions, but we, we didn't have the time, this, this event would have been too long. So we selected um, a, a few examples across the book. And, and the first person that I'm inviting to, to give a reflection over the, the perspective provided by the essay and, and thoughts uh, in relation to the uh, to the opportunity of the book and the, and the way the book could make contributions to, to policy um, is Pure um, and uh, Pure Holmes is a professor uh, at uh, Durham University and in the United Kingdom. She's the director of research in the School of Education and her um, research is, is uh, connected to international education, language and intercultural communication. So she has a lot of experience in terms of international collaboration and uh, she chairs the International Association for Languages and Intercultural Communication. So I'm really pleased to have you here, Pure, and thank you so much for your wonderful contribution to the book and, uh, and for, for presenting this today. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Solidad. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really grateful that you've asked John and me to, to present. By the way, my name is Prue, as in Prudence, so that's all right. Um, and thank you, Ana Lucia, for that impassioned introduction. I was beginning to wonder if our, if our chapter was even up to it. May I say that John has a close connection with um, Latin America, he's lived in um, Sao Paulo and was at the University of Sao Paulo before going to China. So towards our contribution, in our chapter, we discuss the crisis facing Latin American universities, in particular Brazil, where the arts and humanities and social sciences have been deemed useless by populist politicians. Yet we argue that these disciplines are central to addressing global issues and challenges and crucial in universities in promoting internationalization and intercultural collaboration among faculty and students. This is especially important in contexts where young people face conditions of conflict, forced migration and occupation that we see in society today. We draw on the multidisciplinary, multinational, multilingual project grounded in critical intercultural pedagogy, a la Freire, which involves faculty student collaboration and co production to promote intercultural dialogue, thereby enhancing critical, participatory, and responsible citizenship in accordance with Sustainable Development Goal 4.7 in young people among research among researchers and young people in Latin America and the Global South. So the context for our project, it responds to several issues concerning the crisis in the Latin American universities and in Brazil in particular. For example, the devastating recent impact of COVID-19, the longer downturn in the global economies, which has impacted disproportionately on the countries of Latin America. And in Brazil, the election of a populist government that immediately cut funding to education. Humanities and social science faculties were particularly singled out for criticism. As Marine Corde, a Brazilian anthropologist remarked, humanities and social sciences are still pointed out as useless disciplines. It is a deeply rooted social representation. And this is more or less strongly reflected in the political views of governments. Another uh, challenge is internationalization. So Brazil is not strong internationally and the pandemic offers opportunities for Brazil and Latin America to engage virtually. 
um, in higher education. Therefore, one challenge that we're addressing is finding ways of demonstrating that arts and humanities do and can address global issues and global challenges in ways that the wider population will understand and appreciate. So against this backdrop, we initiated our network project funded by um, UK research councils. The project brought together researchers in three universities in Latin America, in Brazil, the University of Sao Paulo and the Instituto Federal Rio Grande do Norte in Natal, and in Colombia, the University of Los Andes, and four other universities, uh, two in Turkey and the Islamicistan University of Gaza in Palestine, and then Durham University. The project responds to the crisis in Latin American universities in three key ways. First, by addressing the challenges concerning the relevance of arts and humanities and social sciences. And we maintain that these disciplines remain crucial in preparing graduates for a complex and uncertain future, not least in their willingness to tackle global challenges imaginatively and to critique the reductive neoliberal discourses of competence and employability. Second, the project repositions internationalization in Latin America and beyond by engaging private and state or federal universities and their faculty and students through researcher collaboration with universities in other parts of the world. And finally, it promotes intercultural dialogue among students in higher education and young people excluded from it who are in challenging contexts due to conflict forced migration and occupation. Our project had the following broad aim. How can forms of education embedded in the arts and humanities address difference, diversity, marginalization and exclusion to open up intercultural understanding and communication, especially where young people face conditions of conflict, forced migration and occupation. The researchers and educators worked with students and refugees to co-construct critical intercultural pedagogies, drawing on Friere, and through face-to-face -face workshops and online meetings, the students and young people guided by the researchers engaged in dialogic encounters to develop understandings of one another's languages, culture and cultural heritage, multiple identities and representations. And through these encounters, young people shared educational experiences, which fostered language learning, intercultural dialogue, and equitable quality education for lifelong learning. The researchers working in different disciplines aimed to enrich understandings of inter internationalization and intercultural education, and importantly, to decenter and decolonize research theories and methodologies developed in the global North. In our essay, we draw on two case studies from the project, and these are two that were concerned with Latin America. The first was at the University of Los Andes, and it investigated the role of pre-service language, language teachers as multilingual mediators. Drawing on critical pedagogy, and in particular, Augusto Baal's Theatre of the Oppressed, the researchers explored how drama and theatre games empowered students, student recipients of the Colombian government's scholarship program to create their own intercultural English language education resources for mediation in conflict situations resulting from civil war. The lead researcher supported students to, to develop learning resources using dramatic improvisations based on their experiences. The emergent intercultural pedagogies developed by the students may inform language education stakeholders, for example, teachers and teacher trainers, language education programs and language teaching policy on the use of critical intercultural pedagogies in English language education as resources for mediation of conflict in contexts of war and other civil conflicts. The second case study involving researchers from Natal, Brazil and Gaza sought to develop a critical and creative intercultural pedagogy of resistance and resilience. In Natal, 
Trainee language teachers were taught to write flash nonfiction in English to explore their own identity and experience of life in the economically marginalized northeast of Brazil. Meanwhile, in Gaza, male and female graduates from the English department were trained and encouraged to write both short stories and poetry in English in response to the ongoing state of crisis in Palestine. The two groups then came together in an online intercultural exchange to share their work. The case study, the case study illustrates the themes and issues that arose out of the students' writing and the impact of engaging online with a particular audience from a different culture with a different experience of marginalization and crisis. There were two further strands to the project, um, which concerned the role of languages in the research process and the benefits of a multinational, multidisciplinary and multilingual network. But I won't go into those now. In fact, the outcomes of all of these investigations are to be published in a co-edited research monograph published by Routledge, which John and I are editing. So to finish, three key conclusions emerge. Overall, the project has demonstrated the importance and value of international collaboration with scholars from Latin America. First, we have sought to decenter and decolonize research processes in order to generate research based on Latin American and other global South forms of knowledge. This knowledge evidenced in the critical intercultural pedagogies is crucial in enabling educators to work with students and people in the community on global issues and challenges in ways that resonate with their own identity and belonging and especially in contexts of conflict and forced migration where higher education may be inaccessible. Second, our work underscores the arts, humanities and social sciences as key areas for intercultural learning and understanding and in promoting intercultural dialogue concerning current societal crises ushered in by popularism, populism and far right ideologies, racism, climate change, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, the project demonstrates that internationalization does not have to be about chasing university rankings. Instead, it marks the value and importance of international researcher collaborations in shaping methods of learning that reach out to the many in Latin America for whom higher education can be an imagined future only. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prue. Sorry for the mistake on your name, but thank okay. you so much. It's, uh, it's really nice to hear about the broader research. And I think one of the um, with the issues of the issues with the book is that we were only able to give a, um, a snapshot of some of these much bigger projects that um, that are ongoing. But by bringing them together, I, I think we can we can create that dialogue that Ana Lucia was was talking about. So thank you so much for your contribu contribution and, and thank you to John as well. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to introduce now to Gabriela Sukim, um, who is an ecology researcher at the University of Turku. And she has lived in the Amazonas for in Amazonia for about seven years. And uh, she's now working in the Brazilian program for biodiversity research. Uh, so welcome. And uh, Gabriela, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Gabriela. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, two more contributions after you, so we'll keep to the to the sort of no more than 10 minutes that we, we talked about. But uh, thank you. Sure. For this. Thanks a lot. Okay. So I am Gabriela Zucchin. I am one of the authors of the chapter Amazonia at the Heart of Global Ecological Crisis which was written with my Peruvian colleague Pablo Perez Chavez and my Finnish colleagues Ilari Saskiarvi and Hanna Tuomisto. I am a Brazilian and I have lived for several years in the center of Amazonia. I now carry out research on tropical biodiversity based in Denmark, Finland and by regularly going to Brazil. Our chapter is a call for the global scientific community to turn its eyes to the improvement of the theoretical and applied background of conservation planning in Amazonia. 
the only possible successful path for a fair, effective research agenda and to achieve desired outreach and science-based practices is via the strong collaboration with local actors inside and outside academia. We found the invitation to participate in this book as a great opportunity to discuss one of the aspects of why Latin America matters, the fact that Latin America harbors the world's largest and most species-rich rainforest, Amazonia. Amazonia is larger than the whole European Union, and it stores 20% of global vegetation carbon. It has 400 billion trees, and it's the world's largest freshwater system. It provides home for people speaking more than 300 different languages. Amazonia biological and cultural biodiversity uh, is incredibly intriguing because of its exuberancy, but also because we still know very little about it. Isn't it fascinating that research revealed that each tree in Amazonia releases on average 1,000 liters of water to the atmosphere every day. As a consequence, the billions of trees in Amazonia produce an enormous amount of water, water vapor, vapor and release substances that are crucial for cloud formation. These clouds carry moisture for thousands of kilometers to the whole South America in a phenomenon that is called flying rivers. When these forests are in a natural state, Amazonia not only functions as a carbon storage, but also has the potential to absorb CO2 and act as a carbon sink because the forest is growing. But forest loss causes a reduction in humidity beyond its borders, inducing droughts that endanger crop production, water supply, and affect local and global economy human health and food security. Not to mention that deforestation releases billions of tons of CO2 to the atmosphere every year. Two years ago, the fires and associated deforestation of Amazonian uh, rainforests made the headlines all over the world. We all witnessed scary images of ashes from burning Amazonia covering the sky. These ashes, traveled more than 2,500 kilometers to reach the biggest city of South America and turned the day into night in Sao Paulo. Tens of millions of people in Brazil saw the black clouds and felt the smell of smoke in the rain. This gives us the magnitude of neg the negative impact of bad management of Amazonian forests. Amazonia harbors a large part of global biodiversity and human cultural biodiversity. There is an unknown amount of non-academic knowledge to be revealed to the world and untapped potential for new discoveries. In this sense, extinction of cultures and species are irreparable losses. The cultural diversity of Amazonia is reflected in various customs, rituals, traditional medicine, and know-how different worldviews, numerous languages. Indigenous people domesticated the Teobroma cacao millennia ago. Do you know what we do with cacao? Can you imagine a world without chocolate? Indigenous people have traditionally used the bark of a tree called chinchona to treat fever, which inspired the medical industry to look for the active substance in chinchona. And they found it, the quinine, this led to the development of malaria medicine. How many other life-saving substances from Amazonian organisms are unknown to the world? Scientists describe hundreds of new species every year from different parts of Amazonia, and no one knows how many are yet to be discovered. And every species, a plant, an animal, a fungi, can contain biomolecules that act as antioxidant, antiseptic, analgesics, etc., etc. And how many are we losing if we don't act fast? Existing examples of sustainable use of resources demonstrate 
that it is possible to combine economic activities and conservation of the Amazonian forests. Good practices can be developed combining scientific knowledge of the ecology of the species, cultural values, and a far more marketing chain. Many Amazonian fruits are of high nutritive value that can be collected without the need of killing the tree. For example, the Brazilian nuts, the acai berries. The highly profitable industry of cosmetics has discovered the value of Amazonian products, fragrances, oils, and extracts from palms and trees. Just to cite some, we have the Tucumã, Murumuru, Andiroba, Copaiba, and many others that are widely used. The fishery industry also benefited from partner partnerships established between international institutions, Latin American institutions, and local managers. After suffering from intensive fishing pressure, edible and ornamental fishes such as the pirarucu, the paixi, tucunaré, discus, cardinal, many others, have populations now slowly recovering in several regions thanks to the efforts of understanding the ecological dynamics, empowering local actors, promoting community-based management practices, and improving the economic chain as a whole. It is thus indisputable that the future of Amazonia is of paramount importance for our society, for regulating global climate, maintaining biodiversity, and providing other ecosystem services. Better theoretical understanding of Amazonian ecosystem and the improvement of sustainable management practices are needed to mitigate the threats and avoid foreseen global tragedies. Collaboration between local people and institutions, especially residents and researchers from Amazonia and the global scientific community can fill this gap. Theory and practice should go tightly together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. It's so clear and so focused your work and, and I really think it's such a great contribution to some of the, the objectives that we had in the book in terms of um, engaging with this uh, sort of shared environmental challenges and, and think about uh, new forms, new models for, for tackling this. So I, I, I think and, and, and drawing these from history, I think is really important. Um, so I, I, I was going to say, I think Maritina just reminded everybody now, but um, if there are questions, please um, go to, to the question and answers uh, chat and then we're going to go back to the questions later. But thank you so much. I'm thank going you, to move to, thank you, to Jaomir um, Sukup, uh, who's a lecturer in modern and contemporary history at the Charles University in Prague and he specializes in the history of international relations in the 19th and 20th century and the history and development of Latin America. Um, so he he's mainly interested in processes uh, that uh, Colombia went through uh, in terms of democratization and, and this is the focus of his chapter. So um, uh, welcome and uh, Jaumir in and we will spotlight you in a second. <laughs> And uh, are you, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, con congr uh, congratulations for publishing this wonderful book. Uh, I have uh, read some of the essays and they are wonderful. Uh, second, uh, I would like uh, to thank you for inviting me or us uh, to, this, uh, to this event. And uh, can I ask uh, Maritina, uh, I have got a small presentation, so if, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, let me start uh, with, a, with a personal memory. When I first came to Colombia in uh, 2009, I didn't know much about this country and about its history, or rather I uh, only knew about its recent infamous past. When I asked students today here in the Czech Republic what they know about the country, it is often exactly what I knew in 2009. 
I have to admit that my trip to this country opened my eyes in many ways. Not only did I begin uh, to learn Spanish, at the same time, I tried to learn more about this history. As a result, I found a treasure that I'm trying uh, to not only guard, but also develop until now. I try to tell my students that Colombia is not just Pablo Escobar and cocaine, that it is a country with a rich culture, but one that has, uh, has, has had many problems since independence that uh, have affected its existence. In addition, I met many interesting and inspiring people in Colombia. One of them is Juan David, with whom I spent hours discussing the history and present of Colombia, not only via Zoom, but also in person in Medellin. Since we are both historians, we decided to collaborate, and one of our first fruits is the chapter in the publication presented today. So uh, we have their uh, essay called uh, Nation State Building in Colombia, Reflections and Lessons Learned in a Time of Crisis. Now, uh, let me say a few words. Uh, what are the important points of our essay? Uh, can we move on, please? Thank you very much. First of all, or firstly, as I said a moment ago, ever since Colombia gained independence, it has struggled with a, a great number of problems that have affected its development. All this made it difficult to build a nation state in Colombia. Secondly, or second point, one of the biggest problems uh, had been well into the 20th century, the fragmentation of the country. Inadequate road and rail networks made it impossible for the central government to exercise power effectively in more uh, distant, uh, distant departments or, or failing that, delegated the exercise of power to caciques and gamonales who controlled the territory through the use of violence. The third point, nation state building in Colombia took place in a situation of disputes uh, between uh, illegal, uh, illegal armed, uh, armed actors, political instability, uh, drug trafficking and social inequality. This complicated the implementation of models of national unity, uh, state moderniz uh, modernization, and the establishment of democracy. The fourth point, uh, during the second half of the 20th century, the Colombian state was extremely weak. Nation building was seriously affected by violence. After the dictatorship of Gustavo Rojas Pinilla, the political elites implemented a model of shared and systematically rotating bipartisanship called the National Front. This alliance did not deal with the country's structural problems. It presented an uh, image of a closed political system in which the participation of other political forces was impossible. And this resulted in the creation of communist guerrillas. Fifth point, uh, unresolved problems of land tenure and the agrarian question. Unproductive latifundis models survive, so access to land has been a factor of constant tension and violence. Thousands of people were forcibly displaced to the big cities. Sixth point, the uh, 1991 constitution wanted to prevent further er erosion of the concept of nationhood in Colombia. It proposed to include actors who demanded greater political participation in, and respect for human rights. The seventh point, Havana Agreement. Uh, the Colombian plebiscite remain, uh, uh, reminded that, take, uh, that taking a proposal for a political pact uh, between antagonist, antagonistic actors to the polls can cause uh, misinterpretation and manipulation of the electorate. And now uh, we came to the conclusion, and I will ask another, the last, uh, the last page. 
uh, of the presentation. First, uh, the Colombia nation is an unfinished and fractured project that has experienced periods of expansion and contradiction throughout its history. A lack of political dialogue and the regular use of armed forces to solve the country's, country's ills can lead to deterioration of the nation state model. A second point, a second point, Colombian historical processes have uh, many lessons to offer Europe, especially at the time when populist forces are gaining ground. The history of Colombia reminds us that it is still possible to win elections by formulating policies of fear. Of concern are the European extremist movements that resolved to return to the friend enemy dilemmas that confront and divide society for clear electoral purposes. Colombia taught the world that the plebiscites can also be lost, however laudable they, uh, they cause may seem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Jaomir. It's, it's a pleasure to, to see the result of a, of a very um, personal collaboration uh, with, with a Colombian colleague there. And I think the, the conclusions of your, of your chapter are really relevant when we think about the future of governance in a way and, and the future relationships that we will create across uh, between government and society and across governments. So um, I, I would like to introduce uh, Sebastian uh, Lipina now. Um, he's a researcher at the National Council of Scientific and Te Technical Research in Argentina and uh, he's director of the Applied Biology Unit. Um, he's qualified in psychology in, our, in Argentina and has uh, experience in development of uh, psychology and cognitive neuroscience. So welcome, and uh, Sebastian, and thank you so much for your contribution. And so I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Soledad, for the introduction. It's also a great uh, pleasure to be here, and I thank and celebrate the effort of editors and contributors. And I also celebrate the achievement pointed out by Professor Ana, Ana Lucia Garzola regarding the fact that the book is a dialogic collection of essays, much needed today, which overcome orthodox binary comparisons and prioritize a relational perspective that moves across cultural and geographic territories. Precisely in my essay, I tried to present a critical analysis of the definitions and uses of the categories of childhood and child development in the academic and policy making communities in Latin America. From the perspective of my practice as an interdisciplinary developmental researcher, I verify the coexistence of different perspectives that can be summarized in mainly two categories that are usually in tension. The first one is, is the one that I call the modern. And it draws on economic and neuroscientific concepts and proposes a conception of a universal child subject whose developmental trajectories depend on specific uh, care practices from their direct caregivers, which in turn determine the child future as a productive citizen in terms of human capital. In the context of uh, my essay, I refer to modernity as a particular social cultural norms, attitudes and practices associated with the development of individualism, capitalism, urbanization, and an exaggerated belief in the possibilities of technological and political progress. The second perspective, which I call the relational one, draws on concepts from the social studies of childhood disciplines and proposes a conception of variable childhoods, not necessarily vulnerable, with multiple possible trajectories influenced by several interdependent individual, social, cultural, and political factors. The categories of childhood and child development that are dominant or hegemonic in Latin America correspond to the modern perspectives, which tend to represent childhood development as a much more fixed, less dynamic and variable phenomenon than what is suggested by the research evidence in relational studies. This is due probably in part to not sufficiently considering the levels of plasticity and individual sensitivity to environments with complex temporal dynamics that involves social, cultural, and political phenomena. In this sense, in general, the modern notion of developmental integration considers different individual and contextual aspects, even of cultural order, but not always in the relational sense of their multiple interdependencies. The concept of integration is more related to a summation of factors from the modern perspective, 
and interdependencies, a more relational concept, are important to consider because different combination of factors can be related with different constellations of needs and consequently demand different type of solutions. Regarding the political meanings that are derived, uh, derived from the modern perspective, in general, proposals naturalize the dependence on traditional family structures and the stimulation of, of competences uh, or skills oriented to an adult model adapted to economic productive ends. This can imply an underestimation of the transformative value of developmental contexts and symbolic exchanges that different cultural systems propose to care for. In addition, I intended to show in the essay that the modern perspective is usually the one that nourishes the narratives of different governments, NGOs, and multilateral organizations in the design of policies for vulnerable children. And that the relational perspective, on the other hand, is usually less visible and restricted to the academic field of research in social and human disciplines. So it's, it's a little bit uh, not visible. Complementary, I try to address the issue that the tensions and disputes between both perspectives are usually raised by representatives of the relational perspective, while the, those who favor the model, the hegemonic one, don't usually participate or contribute to such debates. However, it's also possible to verify in Latin America these days that at least during the last decade, dialogues between both perspectives have begun to take place that could lead to a new stage of exchanges with the potentiality of overcome dogmatic positions and contribute to make invisible the great diversity of childhood experiences. In this sense, Latin America stands out for its production of relational proposals that could influence the increase in the construction of the modern categories of childhood and child development with the capacity to impact uh, the design of a new generation of policies for children based on the visibility of the multiple possible life experiences and trajectories. To finish this address, I consider that the value of my simplified and re reduced uh, approach uh, is making visible some aspect that I consider central in my practice as a researcher, which presents me the, with the following questions. How modern or relational are my own research proposal and interpretation of results? How do I consider the political implications of the results of the research in which I am involved? What criteria and categories should I keep and which others might I need to transform or replace? And how can I contribute to the concerted effort that I am proposing in the essay? I consider that in the research on the associations between childhood poverty and neural and psychological development in which I am involved, I have advanced uh, on the path of the construction of the modern categories of childhood uh, develop and development. Probably I am a little bit isolated. For example, adopting a relational developmental system meta-theoretical perspective helps me to visualize reductionism and consider the diversity of child development trajectories, the diverse trajectories. But at the same time, despite becoming more uncomfortable with the modern perspectives, I realize and confess that we still have conceptual and methodological depths in respect to the effort of contributing more to the relational perspectives. Thank you again for the invitation and for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Thank you. It's really interesting, your research, and very relevant as well. Um, so I would like to, um, I'm sorry I'm rushing through all of you, but um, I, I would like to introduce Valentina Rioseco Vallejos, um, who's a researcher at the University of Edinburgh um, in the project uh, Migration in Latin America. And uh, um, she's uh, looking at uh, incorporating human rights-based approach to um, irregular migration in uh, using a Chilean case study. This is her work for her PhD. Valentina, I thought you had finished your PhD. Is that right? <laughs> no, okay, you're still working. Okay, well, welcome. And uh, Valentina, thank you for presenting uh, your chapter, which uh, I must say that all of these chapters or most of these are really um, strong collaborations across colleagues both in, in European universities and Latin American universities. So, um, uh, Valentina, we spotlight you and uh, you, can, you can now present your chapter. Well, thank you, Soledad. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, again, thank you uh, to the editors of, of this collection, firstly, for, in, uh, for, for allowing us to, to share our essay here in the collection. 
question and also for inviting us to to present today. This is an essay that we wrote together with uh, Veronica Ruiz Abunim and with Ella Keating. Um, both of us, uh, the three of us, were members of this uh, project called Mila. Mila was, um, it still is a, a project. It's a short for migration in in Latin America. Uh, this started two years ago. We organized a, a workshop with relevant actors uh, related to to migration in Latin America. And one of the outcomes of this workshop was the need for for further research, both in inclusion and integration of migrants in Latin America, and on gathering relevant data that would uh, contribute to to this goal. So this essay contains parts of this research. Uh, I should highlight that we identified this gap from a bottom-up approach. Uh, it was really important for us to work on the gaps identified by migrants itself and by the civil society working together with them, uh, mainly because this is why we think how we think our research can contribute to solving concrete and real challenges uh, that migrants face in, in Latin America. So our essay is uh, focused uh, as, like I said, on integration and inclusion of migrants and the contribution provided by the inter-American principles on the human rights of all migrants, refugees and stateless persons and victims of human trafficking. Uh, it's a long name. Uh, I will refer to it as, as the inter-American principles. Um, they were published in, in 2019 by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And uh, the principles are a soft law instrument uh, consisting on a series of guidelines that support uh, state and international organizations on how to develop and, and implement inter-American human rights system standards and, and practices. So what we wanted to do was to know uh, to what extent do these principles contribute to migrant integration and inclusion. Uh, both at the domestic level, but also in the advancement of uh, international migration law. Uh, and the latter integrates several levels of norm, and one of them is soft law, which is also the nature of the uh, inter-American principles. So we focus uh, both on the concept of well-managed migration policies and on the use of uh, indicators. Uh, but I will refer only to the former one, uh, well managed migration policies, just to, to respect the time frame. So, what we did was to uh, firstly analyze uh, what would a well managed migra migrant integration policy entail. And here we followed the current human rights standards according to which integration must be understood as a two way process that avoids assimilation. So the key element here is the right to cultural life and the right to cultural identity. So by protecting this right, states would be able to avoid forcing migrants to renounce to their own identity to achieve uh, integration. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, state would be able to build the sense of belonging uh, that it's so much needed to uh, achieve a successful, uh, society, inclusive society. So we followed the work of uh, Stephanie Berry uh, for identifying the best way for protecting the right to cultural identity. And we found out that it is necessary to differentiate between functional integration and a minority rights-based approach. Uh, functional integration is based on the idea that the areas of education and training, labor market, health and housing are critical for integration. And this is true. Uh, but uh, despite the being necessary for uh, an integration process to begin, uh, it's not enough because it does not protect cultural identity. And as a consequence, a minority rights-based approach, uh, which includes the protection of culture, of religion and of language, would need to be included. So once we identified what would a well-managed integration policy entail, we applied this lens into three soft level instruments, which were the uh, SDGs, uh, the UN Global Compact for Migration, and the Inter-American Principle. When we observed the, the SDGs, we discovered that they do refer to world well migration policies. However, they present difficulties regarding the interpretations of the concept. 
Uh, in our essay, we explain how they could be easily focused on security measures instead of enhancing uh, intercultural society. And we also discovered that the SDGs do protect labor rights of migrants, which is key for functional integration, but there was a lack of protection of cultural rights which could, for example, be achieved by promoting opportunities for intercultural dialogue in the workplace. Uh, these are some examples. You can find the rest, of course, in, in, in the essay. Then we turn to, to analyze the, the global compact. And we found out that even though it goes in the right di direction for promoting migrant inclusion, there is an overall lack of emphasis on respecting a migrant cultural identity. Uh, we analyzed, for example, Objective 16, by which states committed to empower migrants and societies to realize full inclusion and cohesion. However, the objective is mainly focused on empowering migrants to become active members of the society, with no reference to the host country's role in enhancing a welcoming environment. Uh, in our view, that this indicates an imbalance when understanding the two-way approach of, of integration. In addition, the, the Global Compact refers to a program for uh, language proficiency, but again, there is no promotion of uh, language sharing. So again, more towards uh, functional integration and less towards a minority rights-based approach. And finally, uh, we entered to analyze the Inter-American Principle. Um, <clears throat> and we explored how do they recognize and foster the preservation of a migrant identity. Here, we discovered that they went beyond the SDGs and the Global Compact. Uh, in this case, minority rights are incorporated. They include uh, positive obligations for nurturing inclusive societies. Uh, I, can, I can mention two cases. Uh, firstly, Article 63. Uh, social inclusion for migrants. It refers to, to a concrete and positive obligation on states to promote and to allocate public funds to the promotion of migrant inclusion. Uh, so that's uh, already uh, an advancement. Uh, the the, the, the Inter-American principles also identify a positive duty on states to establish labor integration programs uh, accounting for both migrants and host populations. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, different to the labor rights recognized uh, by the SDGs, and it's particularly relevant to make societal cohesion uh, a reality because it addresses key drivers of intolerance and uh, xenophobia. Uh, then another example is Article 39 that recognizes different aspects of minority rights. Uh, it recognizes the freedom of migrant parents to guarantee religious education for their children. It facilitates preservation of migrants' native language. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this, of course, again, goes beyond the Global Compact and the, the SDGs, because uh, it does not put the, only the burden on migrants to learn the language, but also uh, it allocates responsibility on the host society to uh, find ways to welcoming uh, the ones that are arriving. So then we concluded that clear guidelines to formulate the, uh, and implement migrant integration policies are crucial in achieving the overarching objective of uh, international migration law. Uh, we said that the SDGs and the Global Compact provide advancements. However, they fall short on protecting the cultural identity of migrants. In turn, the Inter-American principles provide Latin America with a regional soft law instrument that persuades states to go beyond functional integration and to protect a uh, migrant's cultural identity. And this is, of course, a key element for avoiding uh, assimilation. So as a consequence, the Inter-American principle positively contributes to international migration law and to strengthen local migration and integration policies through a uh, uh, human rights lens. So that's uh, what I can share with you about our, our essay and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Valentina. It's super interesting, isn't it? It's, it's part, it contributes to, to this idea of how maybe the socio-economic political history of, of Latin America can help us uh, increasing the mobilization of, of groups that remain in the margins of, of society and, and becoming 
uh, more included. So I think it's um, it's a great contribution, and I'm just worried about time, so I have to branch through. But I would like to introduce to Alvaro Maglia, um, who is the chief executive of um, AUGM, the Asoci Association of Universidades Grupo Montevideo, and um, I. There we are. So we are we are spotlighting you. Let me see. I spotlight. So um, so thank you so much. I know Alvaro, you have to go soon, but but welcome and thank you for all your support and uh, and and help and contributions to to this uh, project. Thank you. Uh, bueno, si quieres Alvaro, por favor, habla en español. Muchas problema. gracias, Soledad. Bueno. Eh, gracias, Coimbra Group por esta invitación este, para, para este lanzamiento de este importante libro. Eh, muchas gracias a Ana Lucia por eh, haber este, dejado seducirse de que eh, pudiera prologar este libro y hoy presentárnoslo en forma tan maravillosa. Eh, y por cierto, este, bueno, eh, gracias a Ludovic Tilly por... Eh, digamos, este, hacer una mención especial a nuestro 30 aniversario de la, de la Asociación de Universidades de Grupo Montevideo, que en este año estamos conmemorando. Eh, de, desde el, el, el año 2006, y, y posiblemente desde antes, desde 2006 formalizado, venimos eh, generando un trabajo muy fuerte con el Coimbra Group, este, con diferentes personas a, lo, a cargo de las diferentes este, instancias que suponen nuestro grupo. Este, en este último tiempo, en particular, Soledad García Ferrari, que por cierto es una connacional mía, eh, porque es uruguaya. Así que este, festejamos eso también. Eh, eh, pero lo cierto es que eh, en cada instancia, en, cada, en este tiempo, este, desde el 2006, en que por primera vez se formalizó, eh, hemos venido sosteniendo un conjunto de actividades que han permitido conocer mejor a las universidades del Grupo Coimbra, a las universidades del de Grupo de Montevideo. Y, y esta cooperación nos ha valido, digamos, que hoy estemos presentando este libro que habla ¿sí? de cuestiones que nos importan este, eh, a Europa, América Latina y el Caribe, eh, América, eh, nuestra, nuestra región de las Américas, este, y eh, por, cierto, eh, por cierto, digamos, en un sentido de colaboración muy horizontal, y esto es este, eh, una cuestión eh, que, que es muy, muy importante reseñar. Se nos, eh, el título de nuestra presentación es Esto es por lo que Latinoamérica importa. Y yo, eh, digamos, este, podría hacer una, eh, una trampa este, eh, y, y darle dos, dos eh, cuestiones eh, a, a, o, o dos interpretaciones a ese título. El primero es por qué este libro importa y el segundo es por qué Latinoamérica es importante para el mundo. Y creo que en las dos eh, podríamos decir este, alguna pequeña cosa. Eh, no, por cierto, no a modo de síntesis, es, es imposible hacer una síntesis de cuestiones tan valiosas como las que hemos escuchado y las que el libro contiene en un, en un periodo tan breve. Pero yo diría, este libro importa, el libro importa, eh, como parte de esa continuidad de trabajo eh, este, eh, de, dentro de nuestras dos redes, eh, y por eso hemos nos hemos seducido muy fuertemente de poder acompañar esta tarea eh, que, se, que tuvo su iniciativa eh, en el propio Grupo Coimbra y en particular en el Grupo de Trabajo de Latinoamérica del Coimbra Group. Eh, esto, eh, por cierto, digamos, eh, no, nos retrotrae también eh, a la última vez que nos encontramos presencialmente con, con el Coimbra Group en Cracovia, en el 2019, en junio, eh, y eh, el grupo de trabajo organizó un seminario que tuvo por nombre ¿Por qué Latinoamérica importa? Es decir, venimos trabajando estos temas eh, desde tiempo atrás, este, y bueno, eh, en aquel momento también hicimos una pequeña intervención 
en aquella circunstancia este, eh, en la que, eh, digamos, hicimos algunas reflexiones sobre este punto. Pero en todo caso, el libro importa porque es parte de un trabajo conjunto, porque es parte de una cooperación, porque es parte de una reflexión y porque es parte de una perspectiva futuro. Y yo creo que esta es este, una perspectiva futuro de reflexión y de trabajo conjunto. Eso creo que es, es fundamental. ¿Y por qué la Latinoamérica importa? Lo, lo decía eh, eh, dos cosas, una, una que, que, que dice que, eh, digamos, el propio prólogo de Ana Lucia Gazzola lo dice, eh, y ella reflexiona sobre por qué esto es estratégico en este momento de la historia. Esto yo creo que eh, es, un, es muy importante. Eh, en cada momento de la historia las cuestiones tienen diferentes este, importan diferente importancia. Este, en este momento, eh, estas reflexiones son muy importantes porque tenemos que afrontar un momento muy difícil eh, para el mundo todo eh, y para cada una de nuestras regiones. Este, eh, eso eh, es, es fundamental. Eh, y lo otro, eh, digamos, este, que, que, que por cierto eh, reseñaba muy bien todos somos importantes, cada país, cada persona es importante en el contexto del mundo. Este, ¿Por qué en particular Latinoamérica en este momento este, debe considerarse? Yo creo que algunas de las cuestiones que otros de los autores que este, han participado en esta instancia o, 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 y, en, y en el libro, naturalmente, este, eh, nos muestran. Y, y, y yo ahora estaba reflexionando un poco eh, porque es importante, este, escuchamos muy, muy, muy fuertemente a, a quienes nos hablaron de la Amazonía. Este, la Amazonía es importante porque es un tesoro, un tesoro natural de nuestra América, es parte de nuestra soberanía, eh, pero es parte también del patrimonio mundial, eh, es parte también del patrimonio mundial. Eh, tiene que ver naturalmente con la sostenibilidad, tiene que ver, este, en fin, pero también es importante porque adentro de Latinoamérica y afuera de Latinoamérica, la Amazonía está absolutamente, digamos, desprotegida de la preservación necesaria para el mundo todo. Eh, Latinoamérica es importante porque tiene una vocación democrática, pero también tienen quienes desde la propia América y de otra parte del mundo promueven ¿eh? la pérdida de esa democracia. Latinoamérica es importante porque tiene una resiliencia natural, no solamente en sus ciudades, eh, tiene una resiliencia natural que, eh, digamos, este, nos ha permitido en muchos este, aspectos so sobrellevar momentos muy difíciles. Eh, Latinoamérica es importante porque eh, hay muchos migrantes eh, dentro de Latinoamérica, ¿sí? pero también hay muchos migrantes de Latinoamérica en otra parte del mundo, en particular en Europa. En particular en Europa. Y todas estas cuestiones eh, hacen que eh, desde, desde Europa, desde este ámbito universitario del Coimbra Group y de la Asociación de Universidades de Grupo Montevideo, tengamos una deuda permanente de diálogo, de colaboración, eh, de reflexión y de trabajo eh, en favor de la protección de cada una de nuestras regiones, de cada uno de nuestros países, de cada una de nuestras personas, en un diálogo permanente intercultural eh, que permita efectivamente, eh, eh, digamos, pensar en lo que en definitiva todos aspiramos. Un mundo mejor, eh, hoy fuertemente influenciado por una gran expectativa que nos producen los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible, pero que en todo caso es, debe, debe ser una vocación ética ¿eh? de cualquier ciudadano del mundo. Y yo creo que ahí es que en este diálogo eh, importante con, con Europa y con otras regiones, Latinoamérica importa. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Álvaro. Muchas gracias. Sí, esto, esto de no poder estar eh, presentes y, y compartir <risa> aplausos y abrazos es, es como que, como que pierde, pierde mucho el sentido, pero 
Pero bueno, muchas gracias y, y bueno, thank you very much, Álvaro y, y everyone en AUGM. I, I probably have a very long list of people and organizations to thank, but um, thinking about AUGM, many, many big, big thanks to Juan Manuel and to, to all the rectors who participated in that event um, that you, you mentioned. Uh, which feels a long time ago when we were able to meet in person and travel around um, but it was it was very good very useful um, to start thinking about this idea and this project and and we made it happen since since then which is which is fantastic um, so i would like to open the the floor now for questions um uh, i am not sure if there are no questions in the little box of questions and answers so um, I wonder if anyone has any, um, I'm sure you have uh, the opportunity to raise your hand. Uh, please let me know if anyone has, would like to do any interventions or um, ha has any thoughts or anything particular that you want to say. And if not, well, let's, let's wait a minute. Any thoughts? Inter it could be in both languages. Are, wonderful interpreters are there with us <laughs> still there helping us uh, uh, going from one language to another but this is really important because we should speak one common language but we we don't unfortunately so uh, thank you so much for for uh, the interpreters who are actually in ecuador and uh, and uh, helping us from there sebastian please go ahead Yes, I have. A, it's to to open the the, the the interchange. What are the plans of the of the editors regarding the the future the, the the next stages for the trajectory of the book? How how do how, what are your plans regarding the the book for the next steps? I have learned on this online resource that we have that we can spotlight people and turn people off and I, I love this power that I have so I'm adding here Marta and uh, and hands to to this screen um I can I can start we we um initially took this as a, as a project as let's see how, how it goes and and uh, and we had huge contributions many contributions and very interesting contributions and we had to select the chapters that we wanted to include on the on the book so um I, my feeling is that this is the beginning of, of perhaps a series of, of books and these series could be on the themes of the of those presented in the themes the book is structured around or it could be on a bigger number of themes or it could be on on a uh, perhaps on on themes that we haven't included but um we were planning to to perhaps think about a next call. We haven't planned anything in detail, but whenever we, we thought about it, we felt it was the beginning of a, of a trajectory. But we would like to to think about it as a dialogue as well. So if if we receive um, maybe um, contributions, if we meet with organizations and particularly um, across Europe who may be thinking about collaboration with Latin America, who may be thinking about uh, programs and policies that will relate to Latin America, then that will feed to uh, our thoughts in relation to the next steps as well. I don't know, Hans or Marta. And is there anything you feel about um, next steps? Or? Yes, I agree. Sole, thank you very much for cooperation. I agree with you and I think that we should continue this and it was just a first step to see if it will work or not, because nothing was for sure, no? And now we, we know that the process needs a lot of uh, patience for everyone and a lot of commitment, so uh, we know mechanism and we know each other, so I think we should continue and we have good uh, links already, so just to use them. And and Hans, uh, do you have any Yeah, I mean, I, I can add, I think that uh, <clears throat> one of the big issues that uh, we need to do now, and we also need to have all the uh, authors and, and people of goodwill with us is to distribute the book. Uh, I mean, send the book out everywhere, share it uh, where you can, so we get some attention around, not the book as such, but the discussion that the book is trying to make and the dialogue that it is trying to make. 
And also we have been thinking about maybe translating uh, the book into Spanish, uh, of course, to reach uh, the audience in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, we haven't made any decision uh, on that that has to do with money and, and all the stuff that you know, but uh, that might also be a, a possibility. So I think that's uh, where we are at this point. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for the question. Um, I also wanted to add that we have the book on, um, there's a link in issue, which is a, a quite useful platform where you can read it um, online. Um, there is also a um, downloadable version on the websites that are, are um, that I copied to the chat, so you can download it uh, on PDF and it's a low resolution, but I think it's pretty good to read in the screen and to print. And we are also uh, printing some copies and for that, so, so um, for, for hard copies, we are asking those interested to fill in a form that we have in our research website, um, which I also copied on the chat. And um, once we receive the, the form with a request, we will get back to you and, uh, and we will um, arrange the, the, the printing and the, uh, the post of, of the book. Uh, it's probably going to cost between 10 and 15 pounds. We are depending on how many we have to, we have to print at one time. Um, but uh, there, there it is. So, um, yes, I think the, the point that Hans was making about um, generating the dialogue with institutions is really important. So we are really pleased, we were really pleased to see um, a number of institutions uh, and Latin American institutions uh, um, that have signed up for this event. And, uh, and we hope that uh, they, they will be able to read the, the book as well. So. I, we think that uh, enabling, establishing meetings with these institutions and discussing um, how the book is useful for, for future policies. I mean, that we have a really um, a special context across Europe with alliances between universities and uh, with uh, kind of growing interest in collaboration with um, institutions and, um, and uh, communities in other parts of the world, which is uh, very critical at the moment in, in Europe. So I think the, the, um, the, there is an open um, environment in, in relation to collaboration. And uh, I think in that sense is, is very timely. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts or questions or anything else that you would like to um, So um not sure yes thank you thank you daniel and everyone in the latin america working group um i think we have a couple of minutes i i am not going to take too long but there is a couple of points that i just wanted to to make particularly um in relation to to the key messages of of the of the book that i feel um, I don't want to lose track of, but um, of course they were beautifully interpreted by Anna Lucia. But if if you um, if if you want, I can highlight the main things we talked about how um, how crucial it is in terms of global politics and development, Latin America. But we can't see these only in uh, in relation to what happens uh, in in relation to. Um, uh, geography or, or political context is important to think about the history, the culture, the, the sort of creative innovation that exists within Latin America, and particularly the enormous resilience, which is a, t a theme that now is um, essential to, to, to think about. So we have this, um, w one of the key um, objectives with the book is uh, how do we develop new models that could engage all of these different, these, these rich backgrounds and, and cultures and help us tackling challenges that will come in the future, um, particularly in relation to new forms of collective organization and uh, new forms of innovation and that could take us to, to developing a more equal society. So learning from, from across uh, borders, uh, we feel is really important. There are key themes across the book, and I think we make that very clear in the introduction. So the preservation of, of democracy, the, the, the idea of Latin America as a, a sort of um, 
the experience that Latin America had in terms of anti-democratic governments and the way that we can maybe learn from, from this past, but mostly thinking about shared values. How do we understand better um, this history and, and create values around democracy of inclusion, multilateralism and regional collaboration? So collaboration is very much uh, a key aspect of the book and is the, the sort of the place where the book was born. Um, collaboration between people, um, as, as we have seen, but also between states, nations, communities. And this collaboration, we feel, could be the, the starting point of, of, of tackling uh, human challenges like climate change and, and the impact to, to, the, to the environment, issues around uh, integration and, um, and uh, understanding sustainable development. Um, so there are examples in Latin America, which we see through the book and, and uh, ways, uh, sometimes current examples, like the, the concept of the Buen Vivir, um, uh, uh, which could give us some, some uh, important, uh, useful uh, methods to think about uh, innovative production, but also relationships between humans and, and the, the sort of ecosystem and uh, nature. But apart from, from these examples that are current, there are also historical examples. And, and uh, we also draw on these and try to understand and, and, and reflect on those. So we hope that, that thinking about Latin American um, social uh, and economic history and, and uh, current situation can contribute to increased mobilization of groups that remains, remain on the margins of, of social life. So we know that change is needed in a way, and, and we feel that the, the exploration presented in the book across the different areas could help us. And there was a key aspect of the, at the start of these, which, which was related to the autonomy of knowledge institutions. And this was presented by Alvaro in um, our initial meeting. And we kept this with us um, because in all of these, uh, academia has a key role. And I have been um, in different events recently and, and I had to prepare something about the, the, the opportunity of universities to, um, to contribute to sustainability. And one of the things that I was thinking is that universities have been very key at developing knowledge in a way, very important and, and um, fundamental. We've seen that in, in, the, in the fighting against COVID, but perhaps we have been a lot quieter in ensuring how that knowledge is used. In the case of COVID, we have the vaccine, but we are we really strongly um, thinking and, and, and uh, promoting that everyone gets the vaccine? Are universities taking that role? So that uh, important aspect of, of the application and the, um, uh, the, the, the sharing and, uh, of knowledge, I think, is really important. Um, and we have seen examples in Europe where the, there is a sort of instrument, that instrumentalization of education by um, governments, and, and we have to avoid this. And, and the book could also create a reflection over open knowledge. So finally, this, this is a slide that Hans prepared for a, for a presentation that he, he did this week about the book, but this is our sort of final uh, sentence in our uh, introduction. And I, I think I love the way that this, um, this looks like. And, uh, and, and basically, I think it's a key message. It's a joint call for a more humane world where the works of, of Leon Dzeko um, can maybe crucially represent these, not to be, it's difficult to translate. And we were looking at this for a little while with Hans, um, not to be indifferent to the suffering. So, que el dolor no me sea indiferente. And, uh, and we think this could be a good um, ending for our, our uh, day today. Uh, if, if there are um, any further comments, please get in touch with us and uh, I hope you've received the, the links, but if you missed anything, please um, email us and, and we will be able to, to respond and send you all the relevant information. But um, I would like to thank, well, great, huge thanks to Hans and to Marta for, for pushing <laughs> us into this direction as well and working really hard and being patient. And, um, and thank you for, to all the authors and uh, a huge thanks to Ana Lucia um, for your brilliant uh, 
beautiful introduction today and to Ludovic and Alvaro for, for um, guiding, leading these networks and, and, uh, and uh, enabling these sort of projects and collaboration. And finally, I would like to thank um, Emilia Bain and Stephanie Crane, who were who work with me in the Center for Latin American Studies. Emilia was um, essential for us in the in the reading and, and editing of the chapters. And Stephanie um, beautifully designed the, the book. And then finally to um, Maritina, who um, was really, really helpful today. Um, she's, uh, she's doing a PhD um, with us as well, and she's, she's, uh, she's been extremely helpful. So thank you, everyone. I'm not sure if anyone has any final thoughts or we just close uh, here. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> thank you. So um, yes. Um, it's, it's a shame. I find it really, really sad that we can't be in a room and have a glass of wine now and uh, and ha give uh, each other some hugs and things like that are so nice. <laughs> we miss so much. Um, but uh, in the absence, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic to maybe we can take a picture instead and, and turn cameras on and <laughs> And do, and do a, a snapshot of the screen, uh, which seems to make people happy recently on, on Zoom meetings. Um, so I don't know how to do, we can change that to uh, gallery and then I'll, I'll do a screen. Well, this, this should be more people, but um, anyway, I'll do a, a couple of screenshots so we know we're here. <laughs> and and uh, um, there you go. So. Uh, I don't know, Martina, if you're doing it as well, but thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everyone, and I hope to meet thank you all everyone. in person soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.